Good morning, Elkview Baptist family. Whew. We're getting there. We're getting there. Good morning. We're getting there. All right. So we've got a lot going on. If you guys keep an eye on your bulletin, we've got a family fun day coming just a week away. But more, uh, a little more pressing is that is we have some needs in our children's ministry. If you look at your bulletin on the right side, we need, um, during the 1030 morning worship service hour, we need uh, some people to fill in on our rotations. It's a two week on, two week off rotation. So we need some people to fill in with our two year olds, our three year olds, and our K through second. So that's one teacher and some assistants. So we definitely need some help down there to keep the kiddos learning God's word and just having people serving down there. So if you guys would be available for that, please talk with myself, Pastor Charles, or Keith Mace, and we will get you on the rotation teaching the kids downstairs. All right, we've got a lot of other things going on, so just keep an eye in your bulletin with all the different details. Um, teens, don't forget, we have our normal Wednesday night, but it's a little special. We're doing some extra stuff this Wednesday, so 7 to 8.30, Wednesday teens, we're doing stuff, so come on out. We've got some extra games and some things going on, so come on out, we'll have a good time. And we're getting ready to get started on a lot of things. As school's starting back up, we're starting a lot back up here at the church, so keep an eye on your bulletin and look for opportunities to serve here in our church. Let's open in a word of prayer and begin our worship service this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you grateful that we have the opportunity to worship you. Lord, you want our praise and our worship, and Lord, we pray that through this service, it would just be a time of a sweet sacrifice of offering to you of worship. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and honored with what we do today and how we worship you and help us Take what we learn today and apply it to our everyday lives so that we would be better able to serve and worship you day to day. Lord, again, we, we thank you that you love us. And Lord, help us to love you better and show your love to others better through our lives. And it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.
Amen. What a glorious day that will be. There'll be no glitches in heaven, folks. <laughs> no technology. All right. What a beautiful day to be in the Lord's house. Heaven bound. This is probably one of my most favorite medals that we do since Jesus came into my heart. You know, that caused me to reflect on the day I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And he keeps me singing. He set me free from bondage and penalty of sin. What a blessing. We all ought to be able to shout and rejoice from what Jesus Christ does for us. And when we all get to heaven, we won't forget about all of this earthly stuff. We won't focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And what a day that will be. So if you would stand with me as we sing this morning about the fact that heaven came down. It's a song in your heart after you get saved, a new song. And the scriptures tell us that he's given us a new song. And what a blessing it is to be able to sing about our wonderful Savior. He keeps me singing. We'll sing this song of the Lord this morning, reminding ourselves that we're feasting for the riches of God Almighty. Amen. Oh, I want
singing there, huh? <laughs> Enjoy that. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. My wife's mother went home to be with the Lord here. On the 4th of August, we had her going home celebration on the 16th. And what a blessing it was to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and hope offered at a grave site. For those who die in Christ have eternal life. I spent two nights, and my wife spent the third night in the hospital watching our mother prepare for eternity. And God's grace was real. Amen. His presence was comforting. And my mother-in-law's transition was smooth. And we praise the Lord for that so much. But you know, we live in a world right now. It's a tough place to be. And God tells us we're going to fight these battles. That's why we're singing this song tonight. It brought back memories childhood that we used to sing at Calvary Baptist and Clendenin. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. We learned this as a boy. I did. And uh, it kind of reminds us we have a call to lovingly share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everybody knows our Lord and Savior. They have not this hope that we have. And we need to love them to the Lord and share with them what Jesus Christ can do for them. What's that old song saying? It is no secret what God can do. Think about this as we sing this next song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And let's share the good news. It is good news, folks. give you thanks this morning again for another new day, another beginning of a new week, and for a day, Lord, that we call the Lord's Day, when we can meet together and come to you in prayer and to come to you with praise and music and, and the teaching of your word in the Sunday school hour in our giving. Lord, Bless our worship this morning, Lord. Help us to have worshipful hearts that want to hear 
I'm going to heed your word. With so much going on around us to be downhearted about, discouraged. We give you thanks this morning, Lord, that all across this country there are still thousands of churches like our church and thousands of people sitting in congregations that are doing the same thing that we're doing. Thank you, Lord, that we're not alone, that you yoke us together in this way and make us your church. Reminds us of when Elijah complained that he was, thought he was the only one left. And God gently reminded him that he, that wasn't true. So we give you thanks this morning, Lord, for the many others preaching and teaching your word today. And that it's still your church and that it's your church not the government, not the media, no one else that has the responsibility and the privilege to share your word with a lost and a dying world. So it's our privilege, Lord, this morning to tell young and old that righteousness exalts and brings blessing and that sins are reproach to any people and that only Jesus only Jesus forgives and saves. So with that in mind this morning, my pastors reminded me that in a week our church will be reaching to our young people again and trying to share that message with them. So Lord, we pray this morning that you'll be at work in the hearts of parents and of young people and send us people to share that message with. And Lord, remind us, your people, your congregation, to be in prayer. For Pastor Josh and for those that work with these young people, that to be able to communicate your word and to sow some seed into their hearts. For those that you send us. We pray, Lord, that as our young people return to school and the world presents its version of how they're to act and behave and what they're to even believe. Lord, that they'll have enough of your word in their hearts. That they'll be able to see that for what it is. We pray, Lord, that you'll get into the hearts and the minds of a new generation and change this direction this country and this world's going in. Seems like the generation that's leading now has lost its mind. Lord, we need some new blood. So Lord, help our young people. Our Lord, our only hope is in you. If it's not too late, that you change your direction, that you move to change the direction that we're going in, or that you send revival. But Lord, we know that none of this surprises you. Your word clearly tells us that as the age comes to an end, that people are gonna become more wicked and things are gonna get worse and worse. So Lord, we pray God that you'll move or that you'll come soon and rule and reign on this earth. Lord, help, we need you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. I don't know how we follow that other than to continue worshiping the Holy Spirit. I'm going to sing, Thank You, Jesus, for the blood. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. running out of time. Since 
sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the fourth side of the chasm you held me in your sight you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside cross you paid the debt I owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus you have washed me white Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. And life has no end For I have been transformed By the blood of the Lamb Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Thank you, Lisa. My cup is full. How about you? It's been a sweet morning this morning. Now, I brought my backpack. Here we are, right here, right at Elkview Baptist Church next Sunday evening from 5 to 7, our family fun day. The community is widely invited. Uh, We've got, guess what? We've got jump. Island Bouncy House, we have the All-American Double Lane Slide, 
and we've got the toxic 50 foot obstacle course. That sounds pretty wild. And we've got a petting zoo, we're gonna have free food and uh, backpacks while supplies last. I do know we still need backpacks. So I encourage you to drop one off. And um, you know, the, the, it's exciting because we've seen our school system with a little disclaimer at the bottom of our flyer, it says Kanawha County Schools not affiliated with this event. But they are sending that home this week. All three elementary schools in our area are sending that out to every kid. So we're going to have a big, big Sunday evening. I think we're going to have our hands full. Are you excited about it? Okay. Now, what is this about? This is about just our community being around us. And um, we are seeking to enroll their children into our children's ministries. With the startup of Awana, it's just a great avenue. To, and you know, I believe, I'm, I'm really expecting we'll have 10 to 15 families that are new to our Awana program. And if, you're, uh, if you've got grandchildren in the church or children in the church, make sure you come by, get them signed up for um, Awana as well. Now, this morning, we're back into our series of Living by Faith. So I'd like you to open your Bibles to Hebrew 11. Hebrew 11. Um, Abraham's test is the title of this message. And there is a outline in your bulletin if you want to take some notes. And by the way, folks, look around this morning because we have friends with us. We have friends. Uh, I know for a fact we've got a brand new family. Uh, first time, we've got a couple families back for second time. So as you look around, you're going to realize, I don't know them. And you're on mission, right? Um, make sure you engage them as we leave and make everyone know that we love them and that Jesus loves them. So, <clears throat> living by faith um, means we're going to go through some tests. You see, our faith has to be exercised, and that means it will be tested. And the text we're about to read in Hebrews 11 says Abraham was tested. Aren't we excited about getting tested? I did a little search and, um, you know, Neil, I want Neil to realize that this came off of Google. I didn't just make this up. Active, oh my goodness, now I'm not going to be able to say it. Actifiphobia. I had this all worked out, Neil. It was just for you, buddy. A titchy phobia. A titchy phobia. A T Y C H I phobia. A titchy phobia. You know what that is? Google says a titchy phobia is an intense fear of failure. People with the titchy phobia avoid situations where they see a potential for failure. Abraham's going to be facing a test. We don't like tests, all kinds of phobias out there. Here, how about iatrophobia? Iatrophobia is a fear of doctors and medical facilities. People with iatrophobia avoid seeking health professionals even when they've got a condition. Now, if Google can spin out such nonsense words, I need a little flexibility because I've got one here that every school and college student can relate to. And here it is, testophobia. We all get that one. See, my word makes more sense than their words. We get it. The fear and avoidance of taking tests. So the text that we're about to read says Abraham was tested. Now I want to point out something. Satan will tempt you to bring out the worst from your nature. Satan will tempt you to deceive you, to damage you, and destroy you. So Satan is tempting, but God tests his children to bring out the very best in us. You see, in the middle of a test from the Father, he comes by our side to assist us, to build, edify us, and ultimately reward us. So what Satan does to tempt, God tests, and it has a quality of 
building us and rewarding us. Two very, very different things. And the Bible says, the testing of your faith produces fruits. It produces rewards. Now, with all this in mind, Hebrews 11, I want us to look at verse 17. And uh, Pastor Kerr, if you'd come. And we're going to read our text together this morning. Um, I'll read one section. Pastor Curry will read the other. And then we'll go on with the message. But we're talking about Abraham going to school, the school of faith. He's learning something new about faith. And it required having to go through a test. Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested... He offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead, from which Abraham also received Isaac in a figurative sense. Pastor Curry. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Curry. So we're looking at Abraham's unique test. And tester can be very scary, and this one indeed would have been quite a startle. <clears throat> Let's look at the account, first of all, the account of the text we've read. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, Jesus referred to it, the Gospels have referred to Abraham, and this is a significant event, and it's referred to through thousands of years of biblical history, so let's not misunderstand it. The journey from where Abraham was at in Beersheba to Mount Moriah was 50 miles. Abraham was quite aged, so this was broken up in three days. Mount Moriah, or the Moriah region, is that general area. It's a reference to a, a large area, but in those hills was the exact location where David bought a threshing floor, and that threshing floor was the site of where Solomon built his temple for the Lord. The Moriah region is also just a short, just right there in the Moriah region is Mount Calvary. So the Temple Mount and Mount Calvary are right there. And you have Abraham, thousands of years before either of those happened, you have him going to this spot for a very unique sacrifice. I'd like you to notice the account points to Abraham having a great attitude, just a fantastic attitude. It says that after he got these instructions, on the next morning he rose up early and he began to immediately um, be on a journey you know, when I think about that, that fantastic attitude, um, it made me think of how quick are we ready to obey 
the Lord's instructions. Psalms 119 verse 60 said, I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. Aren't you excited today that today is the Lord's day and we can hasten to obey him? What a good feeling it is to obey the Lord. What a good medicine for the soul. Let's be quick to obey. You know, Abraham had a great attitude. I want to point out something. One of the most practical pieces of advice I can give you to having a great attitude, you've got to have some victory in your life to maintain a great attitude. And you know, Abraham, I have a feeling that he had learned the secret of going to bed so he could get up in the morning. And I just want to put this in here as practical, biblical wisdom. You want victory in your life? You want to apply some spiritual principles to areas? Get to bed and get the rest you need. And wake up early in the morning with the Lord and get to the work that he would have you do that day. That's one way. That is one step we can take to having a better, great attitude. You know, it's just that little nugget right there. Uh, other things about this account that I'd like you to know. Dr. David Jeremiah says of Genesis 22 that Isaac was likely to have been about 15 years old at the time. Now think of this, 15-year-old and his father and a couple of servants going up to Mount Moriah. John MacArthur, he states that Isaac would have, he thought Isaac would have been a little bit older, 17 or 18 years old. Either way, the point is this. Isaac was in no way overpowered by his dad. Isaac was an able-bodied young man, and Abraham was quite aged. So we keep that in mind. Genesis 22, verse 2. Notice what it says. God's instruction to Abraham. He calls him by name in verse 1. Abraham, verse 2. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. First of all, Isaac was not Abraham's only son. There was Ishmael. Ishmael preceded Isaac. Ishmael, his mother, was Hagar. We know that Isaac was the only son of Abraham and Sarah, his one wife. Now, listen here. The word is not the English word only. It's the Hebrew word yahid. Yahid, and it means take now your unique son, the son of promise, the irreplaceable son. Take your unique son and go to Mount Moriah. God called Abraham by name, and then he uses phrases and words with increasing emotional significance. Take your son. Your unique, irreplaceable son, the son of covenant, the one through whom is the promise, the one that you love, and go to the mountain and offer him as a burnt offering. Each phrase getting closer and closer to Abraham's heart. We're looking at the account. God's word proclaims this historical event. He says, go make a burnt offering. This is significant. He wasn't saying, go make a trespass offering. He did not say, go make a sin offering. He said, there is a offering of a certain type. It's described in Leviticus chapter 1. The very first chapter gives you the details of a burnt offering. And it is when the whole sacrifice would be bled out. So it dies peacefully. And the entire sacrifice, all of it, is consumed in the flames. It's a very different kind of sacrifice because many of the other sacrifices, certain pieces were offered to the priests for this and that. The burnt offering, get this, from Leviticus 1, 
was always voluntary. It was simply saying anyone at any point in their journey with the Lord can offer this voluntary act of dedication. They can bring their offering and they can say, Lord, I am wholly yours. I am fully consumed with you. I do love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it was a voluntary offering. Abraham has been told to go make that voluntary offering of his son. Now think about this. Would Abraham love his son more than God? Jesus said these words, he who loves son or daughter more than me is not what? Worthy of me. Would Isaac love his life more than God? Jesus said these words, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake We'll save it. So we're talking about the account, this, this, this uh, narrative that's in the scriptures. It says that Abraham believed something. Abraham told the two lads that went with him and Isaac, he said, you wait here and Isaac and I will go and worship and what? We will Come again. Isaac believed that the promise was, in, or Abraham believed that the promise on Isaac's life was fixed. It was irrevocable. God had said, In Isaac, all families of the earth will be blessed. God had emphasized that to Abraham, that he was the promised seed. And Abraham saying, we're going to go, and we are definitely going to come back. He imagined in his heart and mind that whatever the father would just raise Isaac from the dead, if necessary. We will worship and come to you again. We've looked at the account this morning. We've looked at the Hebrews' recollection of it. We've looked at the Genesis account. So now let's look at the analogy. The analogy. I would like to say, um, I think this is a unique test. Abraham was asked. No other human being is going to be asked to do this test. And I want to tell you why. Because how many times did Christ go to Calvary? One time. And this test pointed to the work of Calvary and Christ on the cross. And it was a symbol, and it has served its purpose for thousands of years. And Christ is not going back to the cross. If you haven't come to the cross of Calvary and haven't received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation for you, for he died once and for all. I think this is a unique test. Notice chapter 22 of Genesis, verse 13 and we get into the analogy here. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behind him there was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son in the place of. Now, you know, the Father in heaven gave us his unique it's the same concept the same word he gave us his only begotten son his irreplaceable unique son so this whole narrative points uh, beyond Abraham's simple act of obedience it points to what Christ would do for us so let's notice this analogy a little closer there's a ram mentioned in the thicket and the ram is the one that points to Christ's sacrifice specifically. You see, Isaac was on the schedule to be on the altar. Isaac was the one that was being bound. He was about to be bled. And then he would be burned. And in that process, the Lord provides a ram. 
and the ram becomes the substitute. Now listen, listen to this. Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans says, the wages of sin is death. Friend, this is our condition. This is humanity's condition. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all under condemnation. But I got good news. You see, on that hillside, on that mount called Moriah, where the temple would be built and sacrifices would be made, and all those sacrifices pointed to the final sacrifice of Mount Calvary where Jesus would die. On that spot, Isaac was called. And we got a picture that that's you and me. That's our sin guilt. And God provided a ram in place of our life. Well, the good news is the gospel because the New Testament tells me, the book of Peter says, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. Hallelujah. Isaiah in the Old Testament said that the Messiah would be wounded for our transgressions. He would be bruised for our iniquities. You see, there would be a substitute to where you and I do not have to pay the penalty for our sin of hell and the lake of fire and an eternal separation from God, but instead God provided a substitute through his unique son, the only one like him. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The angel Gabriel said at Jesus' birth, he will save his people from their sin. I'm excited. There has been a substitute made. You know, we don't often want a substitute. We most often want the real deal. But when it comes to the atonement and the covering and the removal of our sin, God has built into human history the picture. Instead of Isaac, there was a substitute ram. And Jesus is the final sacrifice to end all need of sacrifice. So that's why we'll never see such a test repeated again, I believe. But my question is, have you had Jesus take away your sin? Don't leave this church today without calling out to him. You can say this in your spirit, in your heart, even right now. You can say, Father, I can see thousands of years of illustration from the time of Abraham to the time of Christ. And I know myself to be a sinner. And I do not want to pay a penalty of hell, lake of fire, and separation. And I look to your unique son to take away my sin. Please have me as your child and take me into your family. Would you call out to him right now? And let that transaction take place Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Isn't that beautiful? If you did that right now, if you did that today, tell someone before you leave. Tell us. We want to rejoice with you. Who would be happy in the church house if there's one person that came forward and said, I today confess Christ as my Savior? Who would be happy? We would be happy with you. So do that. Don't be on the fence. Thousands of years of illustrations. Abraham didn't know Jesus. He didn't know how all this stuff was going to fit exactly together. And the, all those priests in the Old Testament, they didn't ever meet Abraham. They didn't understand how all this synced in. But we can see it. God's beautiful gospel. You can be saved. You can be part of his family through the door, Jesus Christ. So we see the analogy that the ram points 
to Christ's sacrifice. But there's another one. Wait, there's more. Look at it. Isaac was 15, 16, 17 years old. Abraham was beyond 100 at this point. Think about this. Abraham wasn't going to be able to chase down and catch Isaac. Isaac was voluntarily surrendering himself before the Lord. Doesn't mean he understood the full picture. Doesn't mean he had all his questions answered. But you know what it does mean? He was living by faith and he trusted his father and his father's father. And he was able to be secure. I would point out to you that Isaac points to the Christian's life today. Isaac was a willing sacrifice. In Romans, the Apostle Paul told us these words, I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God. So the analogies here at least are these two. Christ is your and my substitute. And you and I can be like Isaac. And we are to present our bodies a act of dedication Holy consumed, a living sacrifice. Does that describe the condition of your journey with Christ right now? I hope it does. So as we get to our third point this morning, has the Spirit of God said anything already? Anybody here got something this morning the Spirit's doing? Let's ask these questions and application questions honestly. So here's the applications we can make of today's message. Let's consider what Abraham's test, this whole test that took place on top of Mount Moriah, what did it really reveal? Think about that. Abraham went to the mountain. He took his son. He went through the ritual of building the altar. He raised the knife. What did that reveal? It revealed who Abraham loved supremely. So our application would be this. Are you in love with the Lord your God? Are you in love with the blessings of the Lord your God. We have to be really careful that we don't love the beautiful gifts of God and we somehow don't obey him. This test revealed, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Abraham showed it. He loved the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. Church, do you know this is our mission? If you're not in love with God, if your pastor's not in love with the Lord Jesus, if you're not in love with the speaking of the prompting of the Holy Spirit, if we aren't in love with the Father, this church is going nowhere. Are we in love with him? Because the Bible says love God supremely and that will lead to serving others selfishly. That is our mission. Do we love God or do we love his blessings? Love God supremely. Would you say that out loud with me? Love God supremely. Now let's put that pronoun. I love God supremely. Let's say it. I love God supremely. I will serve others selfishly. Let's say it. I will serve others selflessly. Friends, that's the mission. That's Jesus himself telling us what the church is. Let's live it. 
That's the application of a thousand-year-old story, millennia old. Love God supremely, serve others selfishly. And then the next point of application we consider, what do we need to lay on the altar? What do we need to lay on the altar? I'm asking you, what trinkets and toys, what's between your heart and fellowship with God? What do you cherish? What do you hold on to? What relationship means more to you than the Father? What needs to be laid on the altar? Think of whatever that is, whatever that thing is that you think is between you and the Father. Now I want you to realize, think of what it is. And then I want to realize it's not that thing that needs to be on the altar. It is you. It's you that are called to be on the altar, not that thing. Just get on the altar. And just say, I surrender all. That's what we're called to. That's the whole message of the Old Testament, and that's the message Jesus has saved us to live. I surrender all. So get on the altar again, Christian, and stay on the altar. I die daily, Paul said. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those passions and desires, you can't lay them on the altar one at a time. You've got to get on the altar and stay there. You're the living sacrifice. God's not calling you to calculate a careful list of things you're going to give up. God's calling you to give up and get on the altar and don't wiggle off. Living sacrifices, broken for his glory, available for his disposable. What a picture Abraham and Isaac blessed us with. There's a third application. Has God made any unconditional promises for you and I today? Has he? You see, Abraham believed Isaac is the one through whom all families of the earth are going to be blessed. And God is going to have to use this boy. Isaac knew it was unconditional and he marched forward without fear. Abraham knew it was unconditional and marched forward. Has God made any unconditional promises that you and I need to stand boldly upon? Let me tell you something. Let me just talk to you for a moment. Salvation is not an unconditional promise. Not in the sense in which I'm trying to relay it this morning. Because the Bible says about salvation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So we have to do what? What do we have to do? Believe. Whosoever will may come, Jesus said. But we have to what? Come, I am not a universalist. We are not all going to be in heaven. It is those who come to Jesus. It is those who believe in Jesus. The thief said on the cross to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The thief had to Asked to be remembered. We're not all going to be in heaven. Salvation is conditioned upon have you called upon Jesus as a sinner in need of a Savior. Do it. Do it. But this final point of application is this. Has God made an unconditional promise to his children today? Yes, he has. He said, I will not leave you in this world comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans. He's referring to the Holy Spirit of God being our best friend, our counselor, our guide, our teacher. That's an unconditional promise to those that are washed in the blood of Christ. The Spirit is available to us. 
unconditional promise. He said, if you are my child, I am coming again to receive you to myself. Listen, friend, are we living today like he's coming tomorrow? Are we living today like he's coming tomorrow? So, Abraham's test. Living by faith, it realizes that the test of the moment, it builds us. It revives us, but it rewards us. Abraham's example. What a beautiful thing. Would you just bow your heads right where you're at this morning? Would you pray and make that your altar, your spot of prayer? If you want to come to the front to pray, please do. Respond to God's Spirit this morning. Are you in love with His blessings? Are you in love with Him? Our pastors are here at the front if you'd like to pray with someone. What has God's Spirit been dealing with you about? What's been separating you from sweet fellowship? Rather than try to give that thing or that item up, you need to get on the altar. Respond to God today while the Spirit speaks. This is our moment of holy prayer. Are you living today like he's coming tomorrow? That unconditional promise, I will come again and receive you. Are you living today the way he's called you to live? As we get ready to close this service, is if there is anyone here today that has a need... I want to encourage you to seek one of the pastors or just even one of our greeters in the lobby. Seek this out. Before we're dismissed, though, I would ask this. Is there somebody here today that would say, I want to confess Christ in the church house. I have been saved this morning. I am renewed my surrender, and I'm getting back on the altar this morning, and you want your church family to know why are you sitting in your seat? Come, come. We're going to let you tell us in a paragraph what God's doing in your heart. You come. We'll wait just a moment longer. Anyone want to testify this morning what God's doing? You come. so appreciate your attention this morning. Let us close in prayer. Our father Abraham passed the test. It is clear to us today who he loves supremely. We are inspired today to get on that altar and be that living sacrifice, but we're afraid to do that. But Father, with your help and with the way you assist us, edify us, and, and we know you reward us when we diligently seek you. So we ask your help that we would be that living sacrifice. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>